The past's all around us, you know. Time travel's nothing more than a pace from the present into the past, a single step you take in the silent moment between two drumbeats. Somewhere like the ancient village of Karnuni, the journey's an easy one. Archaeologists and historians have cleared the path for us, and all sorts of people come here to find their way back, back into the past. The rituals and traditions of, of certainly of the, the Celtic people and, and of most tribal people were uh, central to the life. The shamans would actually use a rattle similar to this to actually call the whole thing to order. And, and this, this would be also be used by the bards to announce their journeys into the other worlds, um, in the realms of spirit, where we contacted the spirits of the forest, the spirits of the land, the spirit of the wheat. Uh, so all the farming um, possibilities were, were a part of the ceremony. As a practicing druid today, I kind of connect with the earth, I connect with, with everything around me and, and with the other worlds, the worlds of ancestors, the worlds of spirit. Um, and the underworld, which is kind of our past, where, where the ancestors lay. I believe the fogu, which leads into this underground chamber, would be a kind of place where ancestors would pass on death. Um, today, I would come in here to actually undergo a similar kind of process of letting go of the past and beginning new life. I think that the great strength of Celtic society was that it was a warrior society which was completely unashamed of its emotional response to the world around them. I mean, you might think that all this druidism and mysticism and harps and whistles, it's all just so much moonshine. Well, let me tell you, for my money, anything that lights us down that long, dark corridor that leads back into the past has got to be worth its weight in, I don't know, Celtic gold. And besides, it's not the only thing that we've got to go on. We do have things which are far more tangible, far more solid, that we can get our hands on and which will help us to recover our Celtic heritage. The first missionaries who brought Christianity to the pagan Celts brought a new religion to replace the old magic. They knew it wouldn't be easy, they knew it wouldn't happen overnight, and they knew it wouldn't happen at all if they strutted about slagging off the old gods. For all their faults, people were rather attached to them. So they quite deliberately set out to graft the chaos of ancient Celtic symbols and rituals onto their modern, organised religion. They were cautious, and they were patient, and ultimately, they were successful. By slowly adding layers of Christianity to the beliefs and superstitions of the Celts, they carefully buried the old ways. But at places like Germo, you'll still find the old paganism peeping out. Throughout the whole of the British Isles, there is no more than a tiny handful of baptism fonts that go back before the Norman conquests. This little beauty is one of them. And for my money, it's probably one of the oldest because the carved heads on this font have a, a beautiful childlike simplicity. The sort of childlike simplicity you, you find in the painting that your daughter gives you of daddy underneath a bright purple tree. You know, you stand there and you go, ah, oh, and then you give her a big hug. You give her a hug because you want some of the child's magic to rub off on you. That's exactly what's going on here. Nobody comes into this church and is able to resist the urge to just reach out and run their fingers over this beautiful, almost moving carving. It has a magic all of its own, but that's hardly surprising because these simple carved heads are pure Celtic.
we've got two Celtic heads here, and the most amazing thing is that they were both discovered in the town of Helston um, around about the same time, actually. This one here, first of all, was discovered um, by a lady who was digging her garden, and she discovered it about three feet down in the ground uh, and placed it on a wall. I met her uh, in a flea market, and she told me about it, and I said that I would like to uh, purchase it from her which we agreed on a price, and uh, so I did. And um, from that time on, I think uh, she started to have a little bad luck. But anyway, um, we overcame that story. And then, um, within a very short time, the gentleman discovered this one about 300 yards away. He'd been digging uh, a hole to uh, put a new clothes pole for his wife. And then, some days later, after heavy rainfall, he was walking in the garden and saw this little head looking up at him from the grass. So it's an amazing story, really, that these came to light almost at the same time. The Celts uh, were renowned for beheading their enemies, and um, obviously, uh, when they had secured their heads and took them home with them, they carved little replicas because they thought that the, all the attrib attributes of their enemies lay within the skulls of those heads, so they would therefore um, get all the strength from their enemy as well. The Celts worship the spirits of the trees and the spirits of the waters. A mysterious moss-covered woodland, alive with the sound of a stream, was a sacred place to them, a place that demanded offerings to guarantee the renewal and the endless cycle of birth, life and death. A place where they'd carry the severed heads of their vanquished enemies and offer them up to the magical guardian spirits of those places in return for their protection. The cult of worshipping the spirits of the water was so strong and deep-seated that Christianity, even in the time of its greatest strength, could never totally eradicate it. Instead, the Christians had to settle for allowing it to continue and capturing its symbolism for themselves. The Celtic water shrines scattered throughout Britain are places where to this day people travel back in time. Whether they throw a coin into the hot springs at Bath, tie a ribbon to the thorn trees at St Necton's Glen, or drink the holy healing waters at Walsingham, they're all performing water rituals that have been carried out for over 2,000 years. We've forgotten how vital water is. These days we just turn on the tap. We expect it to be there. Clean and clear, bath time bright and bubbly. But not the Celts. They lived in a world where it was impossible, absolutely impossible to ever forget even for a moment that water was the very wellspring from which all life came. Sure, they worshipped the spirits of the trees, the woodland, the fields. But it was the votive offerings, the lavish gifts that they cast out onto the waters, the sacred waters of the sacred springs and holy wells. They're the things that have survived. They're the things that enable archaeologists to take us down through the darkness of our past, down towards a better, more enlightened understanding of our Celtic ancestors. You know, it's sad, but almost without exception, the woodland shrines and temples where the Celts worshipped have passed beyond our reach. 
but the sacred sites where they worship the spirits of the waters, they have come down to us. When you stand in a place like this, it's, it's as if you were standing in the very heart of the hollow hills. All around you are the voices of the dead. All you have to do is listen. Listen and hear across all the dark centuries the voices of people, ordinary people like you and me, a prayer. Listen. Can you hear the tiny splash as the young bride lets her finely wrought brooch slip from her fingers, her bridal brooch, and she prays for the safe delivery of her firstborn son? or the muttered oaths of the boy warrior as he casts an enameled bridle and bit into the clear depths and begs that he'll carry home in triumph from his first battle the Roman head that'll turn him from a child to a man. Come to somewhere like this and you come and stand in a place where men and women worshipped the old gods in the old ways. And against all the odds, these places survived the jealousies of the new. They survived because the sacred springs became the holy wells. In the Scillies is a deserted, wind-washed island called Samson. It's named for the Christian missionary who once traveled the length and breadth of Cornwall, converting the Celts to Christianity. Few people today have ever heard of him. Time has long ago turned his memory to sand and scattered it down the wind. But Samson was one of that band of brothers who brought the cross to Kerno. The Celts were a fierce, proud warrior people. To them, a real man was one who would batter his enemies to his knees with a large limewood shield and then take his head with a single backhanded stroke of his iron sword. A warrior was a man who took the heads, the severed heads of his enemies to the sacred groves of the goddess of battle and left their bodies on the field to rot and be food for the ravens. And yet, they all came to follow simple men who came to them with none of the trappings of the warrior. In fact, who came to them with the symbol of defeat and asked them to follow a man who died on a simple wooden cross. In the Dark Ages, the days before the A30, be its name forever blessed, getting around Cornwall was enormously difficult. So Samson did something which was very unusual. When he came from Ireland, he brought his own cart with him. Now, a lot of people, a lot of monks would have said, huh, that's a bit self-indulgent, who the hell does he think he is? But he was determined to get the gospel, to get the good news to as many people as possible. Now, I hate to shatter your illusions, but I feel constrained to tell you that given the state of the tracks across Cornwall and the total absence of roads as we know them, Samson's cart would have been a two-wheeled hand-pull job. But no one in their right mind was going to pull the chunky chap in the Panama, so we got Dobbin to do the business instead. Besides, look much nicer. Of course, there was one famous occasion, so his biographer tells us, when Samson 
was trundling up a hill in his cart and he came upon a whole group of recent converts who were dancing around a standing stone. He was shocked, saddened and deeply dismayed. Oh, and didn't he just let them know it? So much so there was a lot of shuffling of feet and embarrassed looks at one another and people saying, well, yes, I, I was dancing, but I wasn't enjoying it, honestly, and I promise it won't happen again. All except for one spunky young lad who was damned if he was going to be seen crawling to the missionary. He hopped on his horse and went galloping around the group in a very godless way, ranting and raving, until the horse took a tumble and he broke his neck. Christians won, pagans nil. But Samson, ever the opportunist, and in fairness, never a vindictive man anyway, rushed across to the lad and knelt down and started praying over him. And surprise, surprise, he revived. Well, to say that the crowd were agog would be an understatement. There and then, they promised to forsake the old ways forever and to stay faithful to the new. They would tear down the standing stone, smash it up, and build a church on the very spot where the lad had lain. Christians two, pagans nil. Extra goal scored by Samson in injury time. So they say. Now this church is pretty obviously much later, but the baptismal font's interesting because it's got some rather tasty carvings of some rather nasty dragons. And the early Christian missionaries were rather keen on doing battle with these symbols of Satan. According to the life of Saint Samson, written not long after the man himself had died, he regularly used to roll his sleeves up and pile into dragons whenever he got the opportunity. Well, you know what journalists are like for making things up. It's a tricksy business, history and archaeology. Just when you think you've got everything nicely settled and sorted, something comes along and upsets the balance. In this case, it's Samson's own biographer, because later in his book, he actually says that Samson didn't destroy the standing stone. What he did was carved a cross into the centre of it and left it standing there as a symbol of the victory of Christ over the old pagan heathen ways. Well, did he or didn't he? In a sense, it doesn't matter. What's important is that things like this and the stone in the churchyard are marvellous little time machines that enable all of us to go travelling back through the past. Now, so far as I've been able to discover, archaeologists haven't unearthed the remains of any dragons. Well certainly none that appear to have met violent ends at the hands of militant Christian fundamentalists. So what's all this fire-breathing reptile stuff really about? Well, you find dragons over all the world, in all cultures, but perhaps particularly in Western Europe, you associate the dragon with being the fierce monster, the guardian of the threshold of the cave, and he's often gloating over a pile of treasure. We wonder why, because maybe serpents used to live deep underground, and deep underground was where minerals, where the riches of the earth came. And maybe in order to get these riches, the hero warrior had to first confront the guardian of the threshold, the guardian of the underworld, the dragon. And we find this both in Celtic and Scandinavian mythologies. We have a, um, a Celtic saint like Samson, and he comes into a village area rather like a the Lone Ranger, and his job is to kind of dispatch the monster which is causing depredation to the area, and he binds his girdle around it and he throws it over the cliff. And so he's behaving very much like the hero of mythology, killing the creature, eliminating it, and becoming the local hero after the punch-up. Now, in the Ecclesiastical Handbook of Standard Operating Procedures 
for Celtic missionaries in pagan lands, it states quite clearly that all Christian communities will afford local resident dragons zero tolerance. The Christian church didn't exactly have an environmentally sensitive attitude to the poor old dragon, and so these innocent creatures were very quickly hunted to extinction. Samson was in there doing his bit with his friends as well. He accounted for no less than four poor dragons, one of them in this very cave. Well, one like it. Look, I'll be honest with you. When it comes to the lives of the Celtic saints, I have a real problem. Yes, I know their lives were very mystical, almost magical, but there's a side to their lives which I find almost mythical, distinctly dodgy, in fact. All this talk of Samson slaying dragons, well, I just find that a bit hard to swallow at the tail end of the 20th century. But the thing is, like so much of our history, the minute you start to very carefully peel away all those layers of legend and folklore, then you start to uncover the fragments of the real past, of the true past. You see, the real story for me is not that Samson came into some dark cave and was stumbling around with a lantern looking to kick seven kinds of coprolite out of some local dragon. The real story is that he came to a foreign country with a message that a warrior society like the Celts should follow a man who told them to love their enemies and turn the other cheek, and who ended up nailed to a wooden cross for his pains. That's the real achievement of Samson and his other missionaries. The fact that they were able to turn this society away from worshipping carved heads and standing stones, to worshipping the cross. Oh, and one thing I will say before I go. If there's anyone at home of a nervous disposition, don't be scared. Honestly, there really is no such thing as dragons. Not these days, anyway.